In this video, we are going to talk about advanced FPGA things. You know, uh, you can find like many videos about uh, basics or simple things and FPGAs, but uh, I always wondered like how these super complicated designs are made inside of the FPGAs. Super complicated designs, I mean like uh, you have a board with FPGA and uh, then you have, I don't know, camera connected to the FPGA or PCI Express bus, DDR4 memories or, or uh, even like ARM cores or microcontrollers implemented inside of the FPGAs and I, I never I never uh, like completely understood how it is done and not only the hardware but also how you create the software for this kind of system how you write the software for a microcontroller which is implemented inside of the FPGA how you, how you write the, uh, Linux or how you can actually run Linux on FPGA and all this this is exactly what we are going to talk about today in this video. I'm not an expert for FPGAs, so uh, on my LinkedIn, I ask you to recommend someone who could help me to create this kind of video. And a number of people recommended Adam. So I contacted Adam and uh, as usual, we had a call which I recorded, and that's what you will see in this video. Adam is going to start our call inside of this Vivado software. Uh, basically, if you would like to use Xilinx FPGA, this is the software what you would use, Vivado. Okay, so that's everything for introduction. Now let's play the call. Here it is. And this is a Vivado project I've, I've created and I've targeted a KCU 105 development board. So that's a, that's a, that contains a Kintex ultra scale FPGA. And the board, actually you can see a little picture of the board just down here. Mm -hmm. I, think if I, click on it, you, I think if I click on it, you even get a bigger picture. So you can see it's quite interesting. It's got the, it's got the Kintex ultra scale here. It's got DDR4, it's got DDR4 connected to it, a couple of FMC connectors. The the reason why I chose this board is this is one this is a board I actually own. Um and I and I've been using it to actually to help some space a space client prototype some work. Uh, but it's also got this that you can see down here. It's got the it's got the PCIe edge connector. So that's that's what we use to connect to the uh, obviously into the PCIe system if we so wanted to. So this is this is a Vivado project that's been been created uh, to, 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 to target that to target that board uh, down the down the left hand side here under the flow navigator. Uh, we have basically the steps that we will go through to create an FPGA design. Basically, you know, we are at the top. We have the we have the settings tab where we might want to change synthesis settings or implementation settings or bitstream settings, maybe Maybe we've got an IP repository or two that we want to put that we want to uh, add in, and we could uh, we could do that. Mine, mine there by default is actually pointing to a uh, pointing to a, a repository with the ARM micro with the ARM uh, design start cores in there. So the ARM M1, the ARM M3 uh, processor. So IP repository it's on your own server, or it can be also on it's... Xilinx server, or. It's on your own. It's I think it's generally on your own computer somewhere. Ah, on, your okay. own, on your own on your own network. So, so it's you can, like when you someone can... created a code before and you would like to reuse this code, then you connect to this repository. Yes, yes. So, and and the, the tools these days are really quite into this sort of design reuse. You know, they use a they use a standard called IPExact to kind of package them. So not only do you get the the RTL source code as well, but you you can create, get your symbol files and, and associated. So if it's, if it can be used with a software, you know, can be used with software, then you get us, then you get the software drivers as well in many instances that you can, that you can pull through uh, and use in there. So we get the standard sort of project management type thing up here. We get the IP catalog, which is obviously is quite, 
quite comprehensive. So uh, this one is this on, on, those, on Xilinx or? So yeah, this one's, this one's the one that comes with uh, Xilinx. This was the one that's installed with Vivado. Uh, so you get all of you get all of these essentially IP cores uh, that you can add into ah, yeah, your I design see. You to, can, you to need, work with. You need to buy some of them. Some of them are included. Uh, some of them you need to purchase. So, for instance, these the, these two six four ones they're being sold by their partners essentially or Northwest Logic. Uh, but actually, most of them are most of them are actually uh, included uh, within the uh, within the library. And uh, uh, I know I may be asking uh, too ahead, but how do you like communicate with all these IPs? There is there are some standards, or they provide always documentation, or so they so I'll show you that in a minute and they because they do provide the documentation the standards really good because obviously it's like with anything you know with IP you want to be able to reuse it and, and change it so there's a there's an interface standard that arm created a few years ago called axi uh, it stands for arm extensible interface uh, and that is what's used generally on these IP uh, to communicate between themselves so if you can see here actually there's a, there's a little um, there's a little list here that says mm -hmm. like AXI, AXI4, or AXI Stream. That's telling you the flavors of AXI that it uses. So AXI comes in three standards, essentially. It comes in a a full AXI4 full or AXI4, as, as you can see down there. And that's that's a full memory map sort of infra, infra, interface, ah. essentially. So it's got... It's got read and write channel. It's got read and write, you know, and it's me it's memory mapped and it can do bursts. So it's something and like when you map PCI devices or uh, like uh, like standard yeah. peripheral. Yeah, yeah, like standard peripherals, but it's really high performance. And obviously, because in an FPGA you can't have tri-state buses or anything like that. You know, there's there's dedicated read and there's dedicated read and write channels, and it actually does get. It's simple to use. But it's one of those things. If you start delving into the protocol, it gets really complicated. Quite, it gets really complicated quite quickly because there are extensions to have it to make it cache coherent and such like. But they, but but you have this AXI for this AXI memory map, which is which is really useful for doing high high data rate transfers when you've got memory maps when you've got memory map slaves in, involved. Do you have like um, a specification open somewhere of this? Uh... Uh, we can pull it up. We can pull that up. So you know, uh, we get an idea what is inside. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can we can pull that up. Uh, so the, this is the AXI reference guide, essentially, mm -hmm. um, and that will explain to you somewhere. Hopefully, if I scroll down, um, and so this will this will show you the basics. So the AXI full that I was just talking about. Uh, you can see here. So this is the AXI memory map. You know, it's got the it's got the read channel uh, where it's doing burst reads of data, and then it's got the write channel where it's doing burst writes of data. Now those those are really useful for doing direct memory transfers. So if you're doing like PCIe or gigabit Ethernet or or DMA or video image processing, you know that that's really quite that's really quite important. That comes with a big over that. A big overhead is probably not the right thing, but it comes with an overhead. So if you've got a small peripheral, say, and you just wanted to write four or five registers to set that to set that to set that up, and then you're never going to write to it ever again, you're just configuring it and enabling it and letting it go. Uh, the AXI full is is kind of like it's a bit of an overkill for that. Uh, so there's a there's a subset that's called AXI Lite, mm -hmm. which is just as which is just a simple read and write type like protocol, you can use it like for ur or i squared c yeah you can use it for i squared c ur spi and um, and for setting up registers in the fpga and i'll i'll talk about that when i'll explain that a little bit more when i start talking about the designs that were that you can create in there as well so it's then like uh working with a microcontroller yeah 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 both both these interfaces the axi full and the axi light they're both really just memory mapped. They're just really just memory mapped, uh, and it's just like if you're writing, if you're working, if you were to have a processor in there, say a little microblaze or a little ARM or one of the Zincs or something, as a software engineer, you're just doing writes. You know, you just do a you just do a mem copy if you want to do a burst transaction, or you write a, or you use a pointer if you want to just change one register value or not on a on a UART, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so that gives you the 
the mem map sort of space. But obviously, if you've got blocks, IP blocks in the FPGA, and they're to ones talking to the next one, to the next one, to the next one, you don't necessarily need that full sort of, you don't necessarily need memory mapped interfaces because you just want to stream the data from one to the next. So the third format, which will hopefully be in this document as well, the third format is what's called AXI stream. And that's just a unidirectional stream of data from one IP block to the next. That's what you may use, for example, for image processing or something like Yeah, for image processing, if you're moving from one IP block to the next IP block, then that would be uh, that would be the one uh, to do. Let me just do a simple search on here. There must be a, a block diet, a picture somewhere of AXI stream. You can never find a picture when you want one, can you? Um, but there must be one. But AXI stream, it's essentially just a unidirectional stream of data. It's so simple, it's untrue. There is literally sort of a stream of, there is the pixels, you know, the, the data bus, and that can be a, a width for however you want to, however wide you want it to be, because it's in programmable logic. And there is literally just, then there is a, a ready signal that's asserted by the slave to say it's ready to start taking the data. And there's a valid signal that comes from the master to tell the slave when the data's valid or not. And okay. that's, it's really that. It's really that, uh, really that, really that simple. Okay, now uh, I have to do that. I have now more questions. <laughs> of course. Before before we go into this PCI Express stuff, so uh, let's say you use this IP in your FPGA, and uh, basically, if I understand right, you kind of uh, like created the hardware for the peripheral. You created this interface or these registers which you can use to talk to this uh, mm -hmm. peripheral. How you are going to talk to this register? Because you are on FPGA, it means uh, you also would like to use uh, <clears throat> like uh, IP core of a microcontroller or something like this. So that's a, that's a really good, that's a really good question. Uh, and it depends what your solution, it depends what your, what your solution is. You know, you can, you can write and the tools will give you Uh, wrappers for, for VHDL or Verilog structures that will implement the uh, the AXI master interfaces or slave interfaces or streaming interfaces in, in VHDL or Verilog for you. And then you just have to connect in and, and, and put your IP, your you know, your secret source, your, your, your algorithms in there. A lot of times, actually, uh, what you see is even though you've got a pure FPGA design, You end up with this. You end up with this processing chain essentially, where whether it be PCIe or whether it be image processing or signal processing, you end up with these IP blocks that you've designed all connected together, and they've all got like an AXI, an AXI light memory mapped interface on them as well. And a lot of times you do end up putting in because it's simpler to write software than it is to write to, to write simple control software. So a lot of times you do end up dropping in a little microblade, so a little soft core processor. Or a little ARM M1 or M3 processor, and its and its job is purely just to sort of do that software configuration. Set it up and... Uh, 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 yeah, and then and then let it and then let it and then let it go. So, so the um, other way would be like uh, create external interface which you connect to processor or something, and then you could you, would... you could do yeah you could do that if you wanted to have a pro an external processor you could you could put a um, You could put a processor. You could put an interface on there if you wanted. It could be something simple on the processor side. It could be a, you know, it could be an I squared C or an SPI or a UART type interface, you know, and then you do that conversion to the AXI bus or something um, internally. But but to be honest, most designs I see these days, you tend to drop in a little. You tend to drop in that little a little processor or somewhere mm -hmm. just to sort of do that initial setup, and it really does. It really does help you when you do that bring, that initial board bring up and configuration as well. And it, I don't know if you've ever tried, but sort of like a microblaze, you can get a microblaze up and running to say hello world if you've never tried it in about I five or not. ten minutes. It's it's well, there's, there's a challenge for you. Maybe we'll maybe we'll have a maybe we'll have a little t tutorial session see if you can get one uh, get one up and running. So, but it is another question. It is quite simple. How, how do you uh, write and how do you upload the firmware for this microcontroller ah so that's a that's a brilliant question um 
as you go through this, as we go through this, we generate, you know, we generate the, we, we, we program, you put the microcontroller in, uh, you generate, you do the synthesis, the place in root, you know, you get your logic, you'll get your programming file out at the end. All these tools generally these days, you know, you can take that hardware description, that, that description that I'm going to show you in a minute. And in fact, I should actually, I'll show you a project in a minute that does this. You can take this descript, this hardware description and you can export that hardware description into the software world, generally into an Eclipse based editor where you, where, where it will create like a board support package for that hardware design. So it will, it will pull in all the APIs and everything necessary to drive all the IP that you've just put in your design. Oh. And then you, and then you can write. Then you can write your C. I'll 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 give you a demonstration in a minute. Then you can write your C C plus plus. And then there's the million dollar question at that point: is how big's your application? Because if it's fairly small, if your application's fairly small, uh, and your end board's fairly fairly small, and it doesn't have any external memory on it, then you can merge the you can you can put the firmware in the block rams of the fpga uh and the and the, they emerge that emer you merge that essentially you merge that l file the l file essentially with the with the fpga so, programming so file will, the bit file yeah i understand it will get programmed directly with the fpga and it just runs. yeah and then the fpga springs to life and it just runs now if your program's bigger than that for instance bigger than what could be fit in the block ram that you allocate for it then you need some sort of external mm -hmm. memory. You need to then um, kind of download and it then to you the have a, Then you have a, yeah, then, well, then you have a bootloader type thing and they will give, you know, the, the tools do give you these things. So they will, like, they will give you a bootloader that you can put, that you merge in with the bit stream and you just tell it the memory address to go to when it starts up. So it mm -hmm. then starts up and it, go, it goes to the QSPI device and it then loads and cross loads the memory from the QSPI into the SD RAM or DDR RAM, and then it starts running. Um, so it's all, compared to where it was when I started 20 years ago or so doing this, and it was really painful to do, you know, to create these solutions, and it would take weeks or months of engineers doing it, you know, it's it's quite it's quite well put together. The, so, it, so now I'm really state. curious what you are going to show us, because uh, it looks like you are going to put some blocks together, and then there will be miracle and it works. <laughs> that's that's pretty much that's that's pretty that's pretty much uh, what we're gonna what, that's pretty much what I was gonna show to be honest. Uh, something nice and simple. Now one thing I'm not gonna guarantee while we're talking here, I'm not gonna guarantee that this system would actually work if we put it into an FPGA. Yeah, yeah, obviously, yeah. you know, live this, demonstrations. I never, this is showing you concepts and theories, yeah. not sort of. That's the goal of so this video. So when we get a thousand comments saying, "Oh, you connected that clock slightly wrong," it's like, yeah, it's it's all done live. So, like I said, this is Rivado. You've got the you've got the downstream side of things here. You know, you've got the and and it logically flows you through the steps that that you would take. You know, you've got the IP integrator, which we'll talk about in a minute, and that is that block level designer that 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 allows you to 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 use the IP that's in the IP catalog. We've got simulation, you know, so you can run a simulation on your design at, at, at a gate at the at the at the register level and see what's going off in your in your thing and make sure it's working. And then we've got the implementation side of things here, so the synthesis, the the place and the place and root and the bit file generation, and the the hardware manager does the, you know, that's the point that you can connect to the board uh, and download download over JTAG and do the programming or program the program the memories and such like. Can you debug also directly on the board? You can. So you can put these things these days called um, integrated logic analyzers. Uh, so you can put logic analyzers, and I'll, sh I'll, I'll drop one in in the design uh, that we do. Uh, but you can put these things called integrated logic analyzers in there. Uh, and all all then you know all vendors have have them the name slightly differently. Uh, but essentially they allow you to do just like you could do with logic analyzer. They allow you to connect the data to you know you connect the data to it that you want to see uh you connect the sampling clock and then oh yeah I, I think i've seen this so so there is like block logic analyzer inside of the chip yeah and you can yeah, probe and then, signals ah, okay. and you probe the signals and then it, it, essentially you set up a trigger condition and it and it captures those it captures those signals and it puts them into block ram in the fpga and then it reads them out over it reads them out over uh, over JTAG and puts them on the uh, puts them on the puts them on the screen. 
but one of the things we were just talking about, so is this block level sort of concept and, and, and creating it all together. This is what's called IP integrator in Vivado, and you can see it's just a little blank, mm -hmm. uh, little blank diagram. If I want to add IP, I can add IP from the IP catalog. Uh, so I can uh, I can put things in here. If I want to add a microblaze, for example, I can just type mm -hmm. it in uh, and drop it in. And the microblaze, it automatically has uh, these simple interfaces like uh, UART or I2C. And... It, it has the, no, it has the AXI. It's just the core. It's just the core with the AXI interfaces. Mm -hmm. It's then up to you as the engineer to plug what to, peripherals to connect, you connect to this. connect those mm -hmm. peripherals that you that you that you want. So one of the really cool things, and this is why I always tell anybody thinking about like when I talk to clients and they and they're doing things. One of the things I always tell them is get a development board and try you know and try create your solution on the development board and. It might, you know, it, it's going to speed your develop. It's going to speed your acceleration and your understanding up. You know, it might cost a few thousand dollars for a development board, but it'll probably save you a lot, a lot more than that in the, in the long run. And one of the benefits of having development boards is that the tools are now kind of board aware. Uh, so, for example, when I told that this was a KCU 105, when a, a KCU 105 board, it's aware of what's connected to my board here. So it's aware that I've got DDR4 and I've got PCIe and such like on it. So if I want to add the PCIe component to this board, I can literally just grab this PCIe Express and as opposed to actually pulling it in from the... So if I pull it in from the library, if I click here and I do PCIe, I go to this PCIe mm -hmm. endpoint and then I would have to double click on it. Sorry, my machine seems to be a bit slow when it's sharing screens, but I have to double click on it and it's gonna and it's gonna instantiate this this IP block for me now. It's gonna take a few gonna take a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And there you go, it gives me this PCI PCI E3. So here we can very block. nicely see the interface to this block. So yeah, so we have the interfaces to this block, we have the AXI, we have the PCI interface, we have the AXI streaming interfaces. The AXI master, the AXI slave streaming interfaces, the AXI master interfaces, and if I double click on it, I'll take a second or two, but you'll see I have to kind of. There's a lot of configuration data that I might want to, that I might need to do for that board, and that is the approach I would take if I was doing it from scratch. If mm -hmm. I, you know, if if I just sat down and designed a board and I put it in there, the beauty of having, I'm just going to delete that for a minute. The beauty of having a development board that's and, and the tool being board aware is I can grab the I can literally grab the PCIe Express, drag it across, tell it what I want it to do, whether it's a one or one or eight times channel, hit OK. And as it's board aware, it'll go through and it'll configure it and connect it perfectly for this board. Uh, and save me having to do any save me having to do much or too much thinking about what I want to do. I then just have to worry about integrating it with the rest of my solution. So does it mean if you design your own board based on this uh, reference board, then you can also do it in this simple way or, po or possibly use same code? You can, you can, one of the benefits of, of doing it this way is you can, you can create the design you know, you can create the design. You can then write this file out as a tickle. You know, these files write out as tickle files. Uh, you know, you can write this design out as a tickle file, and you can take that tickle file and you can rerun it on your on your custom board, and it'll spring up all nicely. You might have to change the pins. You know, the pin numbers that you've actually used on your custom board compared to the compared to the development board, but you can you can you can save you can save a lot of time and and change a lot of uh, and change a lot of frequency. So here you see it's. It's kind Much of pulled easier. it through. It's, it's connected it through, uh, and it's if I double click on this, it's added in all of the basic stuff that we mm -hmm. uh, that we might that we might want for it uh, on this on this board. So this is the PCI endpoint essentially, um, and it's got the what how we would connect it in there. So if I put in some, uh, let's think about this. If I put in the DDR4 for example, so as we've got some DDR4 on the board. 
we'll just have it in that mode. We'll have it in the default mode. So if I put in some DDR4 on the board, we'll create a little system here. Okay. Uh, just so as you can see how it all pulls. Yeah, okay. like, so if, I've, if I've got if I've got DM if I've got if I've got the XDMA, you know the PCIe, and essentially what the PCIe is looking like, this PCIe, it's essentially just doing DMA transfer into some D into some DDR4 into some into some memory. So it's going to go into our DDR4 memory. Um, and here you can see we've got the uh, we've got the DDR4 we've got the DDR4 memory added, uh, and we could probably at this point we could probably begin. I'll put it. Let me put a micro blade. Let me put a micro blade okay. in there. Actually, that'll probably go from there to there, won't it? So we can probably take this at this point, and we can probably go from the master AXI port here. Mm -hmm. to this slave axi port here mm -hmm. and we can connect the two we can connect the two together uh and we should see then on our address editor i'll oh, actually take a look uh, on the address editor i'll just assign the addresses so this is our this is our memory map essentially so we've got we've just allocated two gig essentially of uh of the dd of the of the memory map to, um, to PCI Express interface to the P, so, so so the PCI Express interface as a master uh, mm. can can access it if it wants if it wants to. So writing into this place in DDR4 memory, you are basically basically writing to the PCI Express. Is the PCI yeah the PCIe if you're right if you're if you're talking to this endpoint over the PCIe bus, it's it's going into and out of at this point it's going into and out of this DDR4 memory. Um, depending on what you've depending on what you've done, this is actually a bad example because oh, there's nothing to okay. put. It, so you can't I was put, wrong. You can't put anything in. So I was wrong. So basically, uh, data from PCI Express will go to these two gigabytes of the DDR. Of DDR4. Okay, I understand. Or, or, or you could or you could put data in the DDR4 and pull it out mm -hmm. over the okay. you know, pull it out over because it's a bi-directional link. So so that's the a... shared memory between these two. Mm. Yeah. But that, that's a bad example, just connecting those two directly together because there's nothing to populate the DDR4 memory with apart from the, you know, apart from the DMA. Uh, so what we could do is we could do a few other things. We could add in a, let's add a microblazing. Uh, I can't type today. Let's add a microblaze processor in there. Okay, so this is a microcontroller, yeah? So this is a microcontroller, and if I double click on it, I get a, I get a, I get a lot of options for how I want to configure it. Um, what I can do is I can run this block automation on it, uh, which will configure the microblaze for me, give me the high level options to configure that microblaze. So I can say, for example, uh, how much memory do I want it to run from in the block RAM? So uh, eight, writing a program in eight kilobytes is going to be an issue, but I can probably do it in, even I can write something in 64 kilobytes. Um, not really too worried about flash, uh, about, about cache in this mm -hmm. case. We want to be able to debug it. I'll not worry too much about the. Uh, we'll not worry too much about interrupts at this point because we're not going to put Linux on there. We'll just say it's all going to run uh, bare metal at this point, and it's just asking me a clock. So I'll click OK there, uh, and you'll see this will run through for a few seconds. Oh. Uh, I'm going to just. I'm just going to pop this out and maximize it so we get a better. We get a better view. So as you can see, it then pulls through the um, configures the microblaze. It puts you the memory system in there the block ram in there for the um uh for its program to run from it's a <clears throat> the microblaze is a harvard architecture so it has instruction and data memory um are separate buses and this is also this is the this debug block here is essentially what your um jtag pod connects mm -hmm. to so, so you to, can to you can debug them. your code or so you can single you can single step debug download your code to it on and, this microcontroller on on this microcontroller um, on on the fly. Uh, so that's a really nice. It is beginning to look like a nice little uh, a nice little system here. Uh, let's run a bit of block automation uh, on. Let's just finish off the block automation on the PCIe subsystem. So you are not writing any code. <laughs> this is the interesting bit about it and it's writing code is an important part but you know what you really want to do uh and the, it's always tricky but 
what you want to do, obviously, is you need to focus on your value added activities. You know, people people come to people come to me for writing stuff about control or image processing or such like, you know, not for can I create a PCI endpoint or can I create a microblaze or can I create DDR4? You know, that that's just the basic stuff that anybody should be able, you know, any engi- any capable engineer should be able to do. So being able to do this kind of accelerates you quite quickly and allows you to get to that point really quickly where you've got a a viable solution, a viable system that's kind of working, uh, where you you know where you then want to, um, where you can then begin to write the code, the RTL for your for your applications. You know, it's interesting. One of the things I spent seem to spend a lot of my time doing now is actually writing uh, writing code in C and C plus plus and using high level synthesis. So you write C, C plus plus, and that compiles into VHDL or compiles into VHDL or Verilog, and then you get a little IP block that you uh, that you drop in uh, that you drop in here. Uh, I have a question: How much yeah, these IP it. blocks cost? So far, these are all free. So even like PCI there's, Express is free. This, it's it's this, it's a free one. Yeah, it's a, I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, I might be wrong, but let's have a look at the IP catalog. Wow, I was not expecting that you can actually reuse many of them for free. There you go. It, Production it, included. It, it can save you a lot of time then. It can. It saves you a lot of time and money. So let's let's just carry on down our system. Okay. And let's ju- let's just say I want to put in. Say I'm doing an image processing system. Uh, and I want to capture some images, store them in the DDR, and then something's going to read them out over PCIe and do some processing okay. on it at a higher level. Um, my camera, let's say my camera might be MIPI. So actually, no, it won't be MIPI because... This Theoretically, you should be able to find it uh, under the board tree, no? You sh- if it's supported, if there's a supported port, if it's a supported like peripheral on the board then yes in this case it would be put on the um it would be on like an fmc it would have to be on an fmc card uh, or something like that plugged into plugged okay. into it into, if you want into to a do connector that. and then use standard interface. into the, into the connector and and, and such like okay. so if we were to do that like, we could have a video in is the one i'm looking for can't type video into axi stream so we could have this sort of interface module, uh, mm. and this will this will take in you know parallel video uh, with horizontal and vertical sync. So if you've got a HDMI chip, for example, you know one of the analog devices chips that receive HDMI and then give out uh, parallel parallel video. Or you would need uh, to assign H- uh, connector pins to. You would need to assign you would need to assign connector pins. So we'll we'll talk about that in a minute, and I can make those external. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <coughs> and say they're external to my system. And then the output here, this is the interesting thing. This out this video output here is this AXI stream. And if I want to store this AXI stream, I can store it in the in the DDR so I can put in a uh, a video direct memory access mm-hmm. block. You, you know it looks and... simple when you are doing it, but I'm pretty sure that if someone would be doing this for very first time, they would be like, uh, how I, I will what, connect this one uh, to this one? Something is missing. <laughs> it's and it's always the it's always the same. Um it's true, you know. I mean, I was talking to somebody earlier on and we were talking about like webinars and presentation and, and doing FPGA design work and presenting about them. And they said, you know, how much presentation how much um practice and such like do you do for, for these webinars? I'm like, well, I don't do a huge amount, you know, I create the slides, make sure the slides are good, dry run through the slides and such like, but actually doing the actual engineering when you're talking people through it, I I don't I don't I don't do it uh because uh because I spend sort of fourteen hours a day driving FPJ design tools. <laughs> so it's kinda of like one long pre- one long preparation, shall we say. Uh, so in this example we're just gonna take this video direct memory access and mm-hmm. what video direct memory what video DMA does is it allows you to take a video stream mm-hmm. and write it into 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 DDR? Well, in this case, write it into DDR memory. Mm-hmm. I'm only going to have the write channel. So essentially, it's going to go from 
this AXI stream, mm-hmm. and it's going to give me a it's going to give me an AXI memory map output, you know, an AXI full memory map output, so it can do burst reads and burst reads and writes. And at that point, this point, I'm going to admit defeat a bit, and I'm going to let the tool run the connection automation wizard, mm-hmm. uh, which I'm gonna which I'm gonna hope is going to connect this all up for me. Okay, so when you when you run this connection auto automation, it just uh, draws all the other uh, wires which it thinks they should be connected together. Yeah, it's gonna hopefully it's gonna create me what's called the AXI network uh, and connect it all together. So let's let's see, um, and there we go. So we can see here it's taken the DDR four essentially. Uh, and it's connected it to the output of the DM, uh, the output of the DMA, and it's put it's put oh. what's called a smart it's put what's called a smart interconnect because AXI is a point to point network, so you can't have multi, it can't do multi drop, so you need a you need a you need a crossbar in there essentially, which is what this smart interconnect does. So it kind uh, of and, even like figure out what kind of other blocks you need to connect these together. Yes. Yeah, and it will do this quite. It will do this quite cleverly as well for you in this day and age. Um, if I double click on this, I actually want more slave interfaces uh, because what I want to do is I want to connect that like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I'm just going to redraw it. So hopefully this will redraw it in a slightly better way. Um, so you can see here now we've got essentially we've got the video in from AXI. The video in goes into an AXI stream goes into this video direct memory access, which goes through this crossbar switch, essentially the smart connect, which then can then be the then can read then can write data into the the DDR4. That's cool. We also have at the same time we have the PCIe, which is going which is also going through the SMC. Now I'm not going to guarantee you that this solution would give you the most optimal performance and timing, obviously, or or actually even work because it's quite quick. Uh, and it's just showing concepts, but it, again, it, this is also then accessing the DDR4. So over PCIe, we can read and write from the DDR4, and we can grab, we can on on the video, we can write the video into the into the into the DDR4. What we need finally is these things have got a little bit of management on there that's needed, um, and we'd need to set some. I'd need to click collect some clocks, but I can just run through and enable the. Um, AXI for light interfaces, and hopefully, what you see there is what's just happened. There is this um, AXI for light, the the AX the, the AXI peripheral coming out of the microblaze. It's putting an interconnect, which is similar to a similar to the smart connect, only mm-hmm. not as high performance. And then it's gone through and it's connected up to the VD the VDMA here. So it's got a so it's you, got can, a, you can it's kind got of control of these... it. So yeah, so the the VD, because the VDMA needs configuration. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it needs to be told where to put this image in memory, how long is each line, uh, and in how many bytes. So mm-hmm. and when to and when to start doing it and when to stop doing it and such like. So this AXI light interface, it's an addressable interface, just like the mem- just like the full memory map one here. Uh, but it's got a lot less signals in it, and it's a lot and it, it, it's a single. Whereas the AXI full can do sort of read and write bursts, you know, up to 64 or longer bursts. The the AXI light, it's just a single byte. It's just a single beat read, read, write, read, write. So it's a very slow interface, but for setting up over a mm-hmm. processor, it's 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 pretty perfect. So uh, if you would like to do some image processing on FPGA, where would you add your block? So I would add my, you would add your block in here. So there are some. Um, let me just remember the name of it. Uh, I think it's VPSS. Process. So this is video process. Just as an example, you mm-hmm. know, the first IP I can remember off the top of my head um, is the video processing subsystem. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you'll see, you'll see, it's one of these. It's a block that's created. This is actually a block that's defined and written in C because it, ah, it tells so, you there. It's so got that's... an HLS one. Ah, okay. Uh, this actually by Xilinx, you know, this is a Xilinx provider block, but it's written by. And I can connect through, you know, I can connect through the, if I can get on the right interface there. 
I can connect that through and then I can configure this and ask it. And this is a quite simple block. You know, maybe I want to do some deinterlacing. Maybe I want to scale the image up or maybe I want to scale the image up or down or change the, you know, change the Chrome, change the Chrome, uh, change the uh, color space of the, of the system uh, or the, or the color matrix. Or, so or if something. you would like to do something else, something what, what only, I don't know, something special, then instead of this block, you would write your own block. Yeah, so you can write your own. There's there's quite a few IP blocks actually in there that Xilinx provides. So you know if you need to do face detection, so uh, you don't have to write it. No, you would have to you would have to write that I think. <laughs> but if you wanted to do the if you wanted to do like color you know a lot of image sensors they come through their um oh what's the word for it they they they're a raw format. There's no you know there's no color information in there. Uh, so it'll give you blocks that'll do the debayering to to correct for the to to create the to create the RGB. We've, we've pretty much wrapped up what you would do if you. There's a few loose ends in terms of connecting clocks together and such like. But this is this is actually quite a good example of how you know how you would uh, and how quickly uh, you could pull you could you know you can pull through a you can pull through a solution. Shall we then move to a different example? Well, let's move to a different. Let's move to a different. So example, this is basically kind of want. finish, or what would you do after you connect everything? I would so to just wrap it up. We would I would connect all the clocks up, which I'm which I'm not going to do. Okay. Um, I would save the design because it's always useful to save the design before you do the next thing. <laughs> uh, it's uh, always useful to save it after five or ten minutes. <laughs> it, it is. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, but you'll notice that this is all blocks, you know. Uh, so the next step would be to actually tell Vivado to actually create me the the, the VHDL or Verilog mm -hmm. uh, that reflects this design. So mm -hmm. I'm going to tell it to create me the create me the HDL wrapper, uh, and I don't really want to make any changes to it. But, so I'm just going to let Vivado manage it. It's going to fail for some reason. It's going to fail because I've not connected all the clocks up. I uh, should have thought about that. Uh, so let's just connect some. Let's just connect the clocks up. There we go. Hopefully now it will give me a wrapper. No, it still doesn't like it. Which one am I missing? Processing. Oh, that one there. See the thing about the great these tools as well because they've got really great design rules checking on them as well <laughs> so they'll uh, they'll they'll do the nice design rules checking and everything for you so hopefully this will run through and what we'll see in a second so how did you create this uh this window where your cursor is so it's uh, once you created new project you selected the board and uh that's what happened or when you are creating yeah, a new well, project you selected the board yeah when I, when you create the new project you tell it what board you you get a choice you either tell it the device you're using or the development board you're using and it will create uh, all this um, automatically then i guess actually yeah it, it all actually you click on this little button here create block diagram to create the initial canvas uh, but that can take a little time, so I, I pre-clicked it when okay. I created the projects uh, because I didn't want it. I didn't want it waiting like waiting okay. like it is now. Uh, but this will run through. This will generate the RT. It will generate the VHDL, the Verilog, uh, and then we can just. It, it's just like any other FPJ. So we run through the synthesis side of things mm. where we uh, do the where it converts the uh, the VHDL, the Verilog, into logic gates that would fit within the FPJ. And then we go through the place and route process, you know, where it assigns those logic gates to particular locations in the FPGA device itself. And then once it's done that assigning of, of logic locations, it runs through the um, runs through the routing, you know, and actually connects all those up in the F, in the FPGA. And then it can generate as a then it can generate as a bit file. Um, and that's, I mean, that's that's this example in a bit of a, um, in in a bit of a nutshell, really. And once once we've done that, obviously we can we can download it, we can program it, we can uh, we can take it onto our uh, take it onto our application. So, what I want to do is 
I'm going to show you very quickly how you'd write the software for it. So one of the things I'm going to do, and I'm going to export the hardware design at this point. So I'm going to say, take me, give me my export. Oh, it's got to generate the IP blocks. So when you when you uh, do this export hardware design, it, is it going to export whole design or just the microcontroller? No, it's going to export, it's going to create what calls a Xilinx shell archive. And in that, there's two points you can take it out. The, the you, can gen, you can export the design. You can export it pre-synthesis, so before you've even got a bit file, a programming file. And it's just got all of the information. So it will contain, essentially it will contain the list of, um, I'll click this one. It will contain the list of IPs, uh, the list of IPs that are in the design. And it will contain information on this memory map here mm -hmm. as well. So what's what's connected where essentially? Oh, okay. uh, such that the such that the software knows how to build what its memory map looks like and and where everything sits when it creates all the the board support stuff. Uh, or you can take it out after. Um, or you can take it out after the um, after the bitstream has been generated. In which case you can you can then download the bitstream to the board from the software development tool as well if you want to do debugging and, and processing and, and such like uh, so like i said i'm going to export the hardware mm -hmm. uh, and i'm going to and i'm going to do this pre-synthesis so I've, I've not built it yet and this is this is kind of like because you wouldn't just have normally just like one person like adam writing this you know you'd have a you'd have an adam doing the fpj work or a few adams and then you'd have another team doing them software doing the software development as well um and really, you want to be able to give the design to them quickly. Yeah, I understand. So you can so, you can still working, you can keep working on this design. Everything what they need and, is just memory map. Yeah, and, mem and you and you just keep giving them. You can just keep giving them updates. Say, oh, you know, we've added a few com components in and, and such like. Uh, so I, I'm exporting this pre-synthesis. I'm not. I'm not going to change. I'm going to leave everything as is. Um, and then I'm going to open the software development environment, which is called Vitus. Mm -hmm. um, and this is just going to ask me in a second where I want to save my work. And Vitus is it's Eclipse based, although you can, although you can, it, it, it's kind of open source, so you can use any sort of front end that you want. Uh, but by default, it uses um, it uses front end. So I'm going to just change that to. Where did I put this? I put this under projects. Demo. I'm just going to create a folder here, okay. workspace. So this is basically the software where you can write code for a microcontroller, which is implemented inside of FPGA. Yep. Yep. So this is going to open up in a minute. Here we go. Um, and I'm just going to say I want to create a project. So I want to create, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to say hello world. Um, the first one just explains a little bit about the architecture, you know, the architecture of it. Um, and if you want to, if you've got a repository set up, you know, so if you've got like a repository of boards set up, you can, you can pick up from those. I don't, so I'm going to pick up from what we've just exported. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pick up our XSA. So I'm going to go to the hardware. I'm going to go to the location of the project. Going to pick up the XSA that we've just exported from the project. I'm going to click on next. I'm going to give it a name, so I'm going to call it Hello World because I'm an original person. And you can see here it's picked up the microblaze. You know, it picked up the microblaze, so the microblaze name is microblaze underscore zero. Mm -hmm. And it said microblaze mm -hmm. underscore zero here. And this is the name of the application that we're going to we're going to link to it. Uh, I get options here then as to what what type it is and, and such like. There's not a huge amount to change for the microblaze, to be honest, on this one. Uh, and then I can click on next. There's no UART. We didn't put a UART in there. Uh, so by default, the tool knows that I can't have a... The, by default, the tool knows I don't have a UART, so I can't actually make it say hello world. Okay. So we, we'll just create an empty application okay. for the time being and click on finish. And then what you can see, we get two elements to the to the design. We get essentially what is the application. So, so this is where you write, write the code. So this is where I would write my code. I would create, in this case, a new file, call it main.c. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would write my code there, you know. 
but down, but down here, so while this is the application, this is the platform essentially, and the platform can have multiple applications on it. So we could create lots of different applications for for that same platform, and the platform is the hardware design that you know that exists in. Uh, so what it's done is it pulls through, and you can see here it creates a board support package uh, with all the. So it puts the drivers in. In this case, mm -hmm. it's got the VDMA. It's got the VDMA drivers, the BRAM drivers, CPU stand. All that. The, to be honest, we didn't put a huge amount in there. So there's there's not a lot. There's this file called xparameters.h, which is very important and contains all the descriptions and configuration of the uh, of the of the system. So all the memory addresses mm -hmm. and everything. This is the file that we include and we make references to when we want to talk to use Specific. drivers and, mm -hmm. and such like. Mm -hmm. And it's relatively, it's really nice and simple. We, if we want to change the BSP settings, uh, we can change the BSP settings under under here. So if we wanted to add in, for example, if we wanted to use... Maybe we, we could explain a little bit more what BSP means because I'm not sure if everyone oh, knows. So that's a, sorry, so that's a good question. So BSP is board, is a board support package uh, and essentially it's just a, con, a, con, a configuration of drivers to support the peripherals that are connected to that FPGA. So to save you having to write lots of drivers, uh, you know, to toggle registers and bits, it, it gives you function calls that you can use uh, to, to, to control those peripherals. So, you know, the, the, the UART is quite simple because obviously you just use printf and it kind of goes. But if you've got sort of like GPIO or you've got the VDMA and you want to write to it, you know, we'll, in fact, we'll take a look at one in a second. Uh, but if you want to kind of pull through, you know, if you want to pull through any libraries, you know, maybe you're using the lightweight IP stack and you want to have the, the Ethernet IP control from your software, you know, you can you can tick that, and it'll be included within this board support within this board support package. Let's take a look at a driver. So the drivers in there, essentially, the thing that's mostly interesting is the the C files here. Oh, you can see so you get you know, like full are, drivers to actually full, work with these peripherals. Full drivers to work with this peripheral, yeah. So does it mean uh, like so when, this, when we make the UART, uh, there will be even like functions? Which you can directly use? Yes, yes, yeah. There are functions that you can directly no, use. No, really? So, <laughs> yeah. So I'll, I'll I'll show you I'll show you this one, and then I'll show you I have another project that I have this one here, which is really full and actually does work, and that's an image pro a simple image processing one, and I'll show and I'll open the software up for that, and show you how easy the software was to to, to work with that. So you you get all this C here and this C source code. The thing that really interests you when you're working with this, though, is the header files. Yes, because, because this is the there. list of the functions what you can the, use. This is the list of the functions that you can call to you that you can call to use exactly. Um, and then we can then you can write your you can write your code, you can compile, you can download, you can debug. It's just like at this point in time, it's just like being a software engineer. It's just like you know you can break point. It's like stop. working with standard microcontroller now. It's it's exactly like that. Yeah, you're talking to that microblaze in there, or the ARM processor cores, or the or, or or whatever, and you're just you're just working through it. So it's nice and it's you know, nice. You know, you know, I didn't nice know. Uh, I I actually had no idea how this is done. I didn't know that you can open special software which will enable all this. So this is like this is helping me a lot to actually understand how all this works. This is good. I mean, this at the moment we're talking about sort of just purely bare metal, you know, bare metal or low level operating systems like free RTOS. You can run embedded Linux on these things as well on these processors in there, you know, and maybe we, maybe it's probably too much to delve through today how to do that. Uh, but again, that's actually, it's actually not that difficult. It's actually not that. It's actually so not you would put that like ARM core? <laughs> yeah. So, Jumping about a bit, I'll, I'll I'll talk about it in a, I'll talk about it in a minute, uh, and and I'll show you and I'll show you that. But this is really how it all comes together and how it all pulls together. So, if I just pause this project for a minute and talking about this, and I actually show you one that is working, that does work, uh, that it's a simple image processing application. It's on a I'll send you some pictures of it. 
it's on a trends board. Um, a, a, a little tiny. In fact, let me just go get it. If you just, just edit okay. this out. It's in the. Uh, it was in the demonstration area of my office. So, uh, so this is a little uh, a little trends board. Uh, it's tiny. Um, so you can see there's a little FPJ, little Xilinx FPJ under there, a little bit of D, little bit of DDR RAM. There's a MIPI camera interface mm -hmm. here, a uh, couple of USB and a, and a micro uh, HDMI there for the for the output. So this this applicate this this board um, is what's uh, what's what the example I'm going to show you. Actually, I'll close that for the time being, and I'll give you a walk through of the design. So unlike the previous design that we were talking about. Uh, where we had a microblaze, this is actually what's called a heterogeneous system on chip. So this has hard core, hard silicon ARM processors in there. So this this one has, I think this one, I don't know if this one's, I can't remember if this one's got two or one processor in there. Ah, oh, this one's got two. Uh, so this one's got two processors oh. in there. Let me just double check on that. So this is how it is done. So basically, I always thought yeah. like they are kind of separate and you need to work with them like you work with FPGA and you work with the ARM, but it looks like this uh, Xilinx software, you work you work with this like with big FPGA with two ARMs on it. Yeah, so it's a, this, this one's got two ARM cores on it. I mean, the, the MPSOC's got four... A53 processors on it, two R5 and a Mali GPU. You know, the Versal's got uh, A72s on there and, and the R5. So, so th these instead are kind of putting of... the microcontroller as we did in the previous project, you directly have here this ARM Do you cores. have the zinc? And what's nice about these ARM cores is you have to configure them. You know, they're, they're directly connected to DDR. They're directly connected to the DDR and such on the board. So you have to... You have to configure the timings, you know, the DDR timings and such like. But you can also, they also have this thing called multiplexed I.O. that's connected to the processor. So you can you can say, well, you know, have these 54 pins. Well, do I want it to be USB? Do I want it to be an S and a UR? Do I want it to be a gigabit Ethernet or something? So you get you get this hard performance, hard, e you know, hard silicon that's still sort of semi-customizable. Um, and... The best way to think about it is the device is kind of these two elements to the device is the processing system, which has got the arm cores in it. And it's got it's got everything you can see in this block diagram here. And then you've got the programmable logic. And how they communicate again is over these AXI links. Mm -hmm. So there's a number there's a number of AXI links from the processor to the programmable logic and from the programmable logic to the processor. Now. In some case, you know, there's some from the processor to the programmable logic, so that the processor can be the initiator of the sequence, and there's other ones that go from the programmable logic to the processor, so as the processor can be the programmable logic can be the initiator of the sequence. So, for example, on the connecting to this AXI bus, um, on how, this high performance, how fast are these parts? So these, off the top of my head, I want to say the maximum is about three hundred. Oh, uh, the MPSOC one, so the next generation up from this is the one I can remember, and they're about 330 megabit, 330 megahertz, uh, and they're 64 or 128, they're 64 bits. So you can get you can get quite a lot of data across them. Um, I'll have to look up the ones for the I'll have to look up the seven series ones because it's been a little while since I've um, since I've answered that. But for instance, this these ports here. The programmable logic can access any of these peripherals in mm -hmm. here, so it's just a me it's just memory map. So you can you can literally come in through this high performance port here, and you can actually write and read at read memory frames into the DDR memory for the processor, uh, which is what this application does. So this application, I'm just going to pop it out a little bit. So we have the Zinc processing system here, uh, and that's configured. We have a we have two blocks essentially. Then we have a MIPI input block. Um, so, so this, this is what we are that... going to implement on the small board. What you just showed on the camera. Yeah. So this is okay. this is all on this small tiny board. Uh, and what we have here is we have a 
a, a MIPI interface, so a uh, you know the the MIPI interface, and this is a this is a free this IP calls freeform Xilinx as well uh, in the latest versions. I, I do say that because some of them some of the earlier versions you had to pay for it, but now it's now it's got now it's kind of free. Uh, so we have this MIPI interface. We have a a simple subset converter, which is basically just doing a bus translation. Uh, so if I, if I double click on these, you can see these a little bit. So you can see the configuration of the um, of the MIPI interface. So this the, is connected uh, to connector. The MIPI phi if that's what is connected is to connected, connector. This is connected, yeah, mm -hmm. directly to directly okay. to here. Um, we have this, and then the output of this, the output is a MIPI, the output is this video stream again. Mm -hmm. It's always this AXI stream. So I have. I have here one of these logic analyzers connected onto it because I'm paranoid and I want to make sure when I'm bringing this up that I can see data streaming out of it. If I can't see data at this point, I've got a, you know, I know that I've got an issue here. Um, I've got a subset converter and all that does basically, it just does a little bit of manipulation uh, on the, on the day, on the AXI stream coming out. I, I get, I get 10 bits of pixel data coming out, but I actually only want eight because mm -hmm. it just makes it a little bit easier. So I just throw away a couple of bits. Mm -hmm. um, and then because the image sensor is a raw image sensor, uh, I have we have this demosaic here, uh, which does the, the, the raw to RGB conversion. Mm -hmm. So essentially at this point, we're taking in a, we're taking in a, an eight bit pixel. And then at this point, we're popping out a 24-bit pixel where we've got 8 bits red, 8 bits green, 8 bits blue. And what is the interface on video out from the uh, MIPI CSI2 subsystem? This one, so this, on is an AXI, so this is an AXI stream output. So it, it's literally just streaming uh, streaming data out. It uses the uh, the data stream it gives out the ready the ready and the valid signals are used mm -hmm. but to give to give timing information we use there are sideband signals oh. so it uses the it uses the t user signal which should be on here the t user signal so you see a clock you see a pulse on that that indicates the start of a new image frame so uh, uh, sorry for interrupting i think we need to explain like MIPI interface, these are differential pairs and you can have like multiple differential pairs, correct? They are, they, well, MIPI is a very weird standard, isn't it? It's differential and single ended at the same time. Yeah. I don't know if you've done much, I don't know if you've done much work with MIPI, but it has single ended and then it goes different. It has single ended for the control and differential for the, uh, but, uh, the data. The, are, the data. Uh, these are serial data, correct? It is. It's serial data. So uh, we need to somehow make them parallel then. It, so, yes. So it, it's high speed serial data coming in. Uh, and you get this on MIPI, you get this. It does go to single ended on the same lines. It goes to single ended to, to give it packet information, essentially, to tell it when there's a new packet of data coming down or not. And then you get this high speed differential data coming down across multiple lanes. Uh, this is a simple camera, so this has got two lanes of data coming down. So we have to take these two serial lanes of data and convert them into a 10-bit parallel pixel coming out. So that's what we do where? In this, in this subsystem? block here. Okay. So this, this subsystem here, this IP block here, is, is doing the full MIPI CSI2 decoding. Uh, and it's just giving us a stream of pixels out. Uh, literally, it's just the stream of pixels coming out. Uh, and it's telling us whether they're valid, you know, whether the data's valid or not, depending. Because it'll be a little bit bursty, depending upon the data rates coming down. Um, but the thing is, if you've got a never-ending stream of pixels, how do you know where that? How do you know where the top pixel is and the bottom pixel is on an image or a line? So it uses these uh, the sideband. It uses some sideband signals to convey that information. So it uses this T. It uses the T user to indicate a pulse on to user indicates the start of a new frame start of a new image frame so so what it, what is this kind of interface it is like fpga thing or it's all yeah it's just pure fpga it's back to the axi streaming that we were talking about earlier on it, it's purely just AXI so it's streaming. kind of special format or special kind of bus or it, what 
Yeah, it, it fits within, it's within the ARM extensible interface. It's one of the three interfaces that we talked about earlier on right at the start. You know, the AXI, the ah, AXI memory okay. map, the okay. AXI light, the AXI stream. Okay, I understand now. This is, this is just an AXI stream, but it has, to that AXI stream, which essentially only has, by default, only has to have three signals to it, you know, a, a ready, a valid, and the data. Mm-hmm. This has some sideband signals. It has the T user to indicate the start of a frame and T T last to indicate the last pixel in a line. So knowing the start and the last pixels in a line, you can recreate an image. If you, you can recreate, you can re, you can convert from a stream to a to mm-hmm. an image eventually. Okay. So what the, so what this does is it goes through here and by this point, you know, this is raw video coming in, raw video coming out of here. There's no color comp. It's just either red, green, or blue depending upon what pixels it's come out of this this by the time we get to this output here we've got the rgb pixels coming mm-hmm. and it's in the same it's in the same streaming format ah uh, okay and then we have this video direct memory access again if you remember that from the last one uh, so we have a vdma block and essentially what this vdma block is doing is it's going into the slave high performance port on the on the zinc and it's writing which, the data to the memory yes it's writing the data to the ddr memory so it's just going in through this port it's going in through the interface controller and it ends up in the ddr ends up in the ddr memory and then because in this application i'm not really doing anything in this <coughs> not really doing anything in the software processing but what I'm doing is I'm using the DDR memory as essentially just as a frame buffer. Mm-hmm. And so I write it in, and then the same VDMA is also reading it out. You know, it's writing in frames, and then it's reading out other frames. Um, and then we have this output path here. Okay. Uh, let me pop that. Out. Let me pop that out a little bit. Uh, and what that's doing is it takes the stream from the VDM from the DDR memory. It mm-hmm. takes the stream. I, in the DDR, in the subset controller, I change the order of the bits about a bit okay. uh, to make sure that they're, to make sure that the RGB are aligned properly and it's not BGR, essentially. I, I, I make the bits aligned properly for the, and then we have this IP block here that takes the stream and does the exact opposite of what comes in and converts it into a parallel output. So an output that can go. Uh, yeah, that could be displayed on a on a VGA monitor or something. So it's so it like gives out uh, the... what is the last uh, block is DVI or so yeah. So this this block here converts it into a straight into the normal gives you the pixels, the horizontal sync and the vertical sync like you need to see yeah, a picture. Yeah, I see. It, yeah. This this final this final block here actually takes that straight that that that, that pixel information and converts it into a DVI type HDMI type interface. HDMI, yeah. So that it can get sent down, where are we? Sent down this this connector here. So you are telling me that when you connect this HDMI connector, you will see the picture on monitor from the camera. You see the picture on the monitor on the camera, and I will go to. I I, I picked this up a second ago, and I'm, I'm not sure if I gave it static shock or not. But I will go pick it up, and at the end of the video, I'll connect it all up and turn it on, so as we can, uh, so as we can, so as we can see it. The only final bit is this video timing controller. Uh, and this just generates timing signals for the video mode you want. So it just tells, it's just generating essentially vertical syncs and horizontal sync frequencies for the for the display set, for the display resolution that you want. So that's really nice and simple. So basically, in this configuration, if you would like to do, for example, face detection, then you would write some code for the arm, which would draw the squares around the faces. Exactly. Yes. Yes. And this would be kind of add into the picture, these squares. Add into the picture and done in software, yeah. So it runs really nicely um, and it connects all together. So this this is then, this is really all there is to it. You know, it's a really, it's a fairly simple, it's a fairly small FPGA, this one. You know, this one, I think this board retails for about a about $100 or something. Uh, and it's a Zinc 7010 FPGA, so there's not a huge amount of logic resources in it. Uh so I synthesize it, I place and root it, create the design. If I open the design, I'll just show you just how full this FPGA is. So 
So does it mean that now theoretically it could work without any software? Once you uh, once you upload this FPGA code, the... no. Okay. <laughs> and the reason for, the reason for that is memory configuration IP... or what? Yes, all of these IP blocks need some software to configure them to tell okay. them what to do. You you cannot uh, directly do this kind of like initial configuration in the setup of the block. You could you could if you wanted to, it, but it is easier to do it in the um, software. You would need you would yeah, it's easier to do it in software, and it's interesting. I was having another discussion with somebody earlier on, and we were saying you know we're, we're kind of in the age now of software configurability. You know, you you kind of put the IP blocks in there with these registers, and then some software or some sort of big state machine goes round and configures it configures it all. Uh, but this is the this is the design when it's implemented. Uh, so you can see if you so zoom in. So this is the silicon, can... or what is it? Yeah, this is the silicon. So over here is the processing logic, the processing system, uh, and then these are all the logic elements that mm -hmm. are in the design. And blue so means the individual logic. blue means it's used. Blue means blue means it's used. <laughs> so it's literally quite it's quite shoehorned uh, shoehorned in there. Uh, actually, it's not that bad. We've only used eighty percent of the of the. We've only used eighty percent of the lookup tables. You, you can add uh, some ends. Sixty percent, sixty percent of the sixty percent of the block RAMs, and even better, it do, it does actually meet it does actually meet timing. Uh, so it, it it's uh, there's no there's no timing errors or anything anything with it. So that's a nice. So that's a nice simple design. So. But this is, like I say, software configurable. So if I wanted to do the software, yeah, I that was my next in. question. Yeah. So and I think this wraps up nicely what we were just showing. So I open Vitus again, and hopefully I can remember where I stored the software. Normally I have a quite a hard and fast rule that I store it with the project, such that I don't, it's not somewhere else on my network that I have to go find it. Uh, but let's just open Vitus, and we'll go, uh, we'll go find it. So this is under C, HDL projects, zinc very zero. So this is going to be some kind of standard microcontroller type software, no operating system, or? Uh, so this has just got bare metal running on it. There's no operating system. I didn't put any Linux on there or anything. Um, so you can just, you can you just, just run bare C on the ARM cores. Yeah, this is just running better, and I'm only actually running it on one of the ARM cores because there's there wasn't any um, any need to do anything else. Um, so, so again, very similar to what I showed you last time, we have this platform at the bottom that's that's got all the board support packages. It's pulled for all the IP. This time, if we take a look, buried down. You'll see we've got quite a few more IP blocks in there this time. These are the uh, blocks you know, what we were talking about. These are the blocks. So, well, some of these are the blocks. Some of these blocks are included in the processor system as well, not mm -hmm. just the blocks that I put in the the design. Mm -hmm. So, for example, it gives you the, UART, the you know the yeah, you are the U, the you are the USB. But here's the here's the video demosaic. Here's the video timing controller. Here's the you know here's the DMA block that we were just talking about. Here's the MIPI interface that we were talking about as well. And then under my application, which is under here, I can I have my Hello World program. Printf. Printf, yeah, printf's here. You know, print. Actually, I use actually Xilinx provide a lower footprint than printf, so I, I tend to use that. Print, yeah. Um, yeah, print. It does the same thing. It just doesn't take up quite as much memory. Uh, but you can see here, I've just basically all the, I all the you know all the IOs, all the BSPs, all the APIs that it provides. I just call them through here in, in the include file. You know, mm -hmm. include, include the header file. You declare the instance here. Essentially, you know, you declare a variable but, here. But there is no UART. Is. is there UART? Which no, one, because which I'm, one is UART? because the. Because the UART's just print, the UART's just mapped as the standard in and standard out. So literally, if you just call a print or a printf, ah. it'll throw it out to it'll throw it out to the UART. Um, 
And then what I've done, you know, simple things, you know, like I've defined some cam, I've defined some I squared C addresses, some clock rates for I squared C to because the camera is actually connected and configured over I squared C. Um, I've declared a couple of frames. I've declared some frames here. You know, I've declared the I've declared a memory area for the actual frames where I want to store my where I want to store my data. Uh, and then literally, it's fairly simple in that it walks through and it uses the um, uses the API configurations uh, to configure the the relevant IP block. So in this instance, it's there's an I there's an I squared C block that's in the processing system. So it's configuring the I squared it's configuring the I squared C. Mm -hmm. It's then configuring the video timing controller. Uh, and then I'm being very simple. There's a little I squared C switch on the board, so I'm just sending an I squared C message, you know, to to set the switch the way I want it to, the way I want it so to. So the set. master send pull, that's uh, kind of send that's byte. Just, yeah, that's just to send. I send send a group of bytes. So if I want to see what it is, I can click on it and it'll open up, and then I can see so, the, you know, see the see the de see the declaration okay. of it and how it all works. Could you use like uh, if you go into I square C driver is not there like send a byte or something? Or yeah, there's, 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 there's no other... I square C in the list. So there is the full I square C. Ah, okay. Uh, so this is the drivers. I square C. I I C P S. That's the I square C. Correct. Yeah, and I'm yeah, and I'm calling this function here just because I wanted to send okay. some byte. I want okay. to send. Actually, in this case, I'm sending one byte. To, to the software okay. to the I, I was just confused because it's not called I square C. <laughs> uh, it's I I C. It calls it I I C. Okay. Uh, um, not I squared C. So then it, it it runs a simple thing, you know, runs a little function over I squared C to detect the camera, which is down the bottom. Uh, you know, over I squared C, it interrogates the camera to see if it, get, it interrogates a register on the camera to see if it gets the right who am I value back. If we get to that point, we know that the camera's connected, we know that the FPGA is programmed and we know that we can we can see that we can see the camera. And then literally we send some configuration data uh, down to configure the camera over I squared C. Now that we know that it's connected to I squared C, we send some configuration data down to configure the imager to give us the, you know, to behave in the in the way that we want it. So uh, to give us a, an image frame. This is working at 720p. So to give us a 720p, use two MIPI lanes and such like. And that's all programming this this PCAM5 camera that's that's in here. Um, and then once that's done, we set up the video timing controller, which is relatively simple by making a few by making a few read and writes from a from a register. Uh, so these are all so, the settings so, what you read from the camera yeah, data sheet. From the camera data, well, these are mostly from the camera data sheet. Yeah, these are these are for the video timing mode. So there's actually a there's actually a video library. There's a VGA modes dot h that that comes with it that tells you what all of the uh, video that the front porch, the back mm -hmm. porch, all of the video, all of the video timings are. So you can just set you can just set all that up, and then literally we set the do a little bit of point just do a little bit of pointer maths here to set the pointers up correctly for the for the frame buffers that we're going to be talking to and then really we set the dma transfer up so we just say you know where the images where the images are the mode of it the size of the size of the image the width of the image now the important thing is the width is the width in bytes not the width in pixels it's the width in bytes and that that can because that normally catches people out um and once we've got that, we can start the VDA. We can start that VDMA reading and writing from memory, uh, and then we can just start the rest of the uh, just start the rest of the image processing pipeline. So literally, just tell the video D mosaic, just tell it the pattern. You know whether it's BGR, RGB, or whatever the the, the overlay pattern, and just enable it. And the final line here is it really just turns the VDMA on, and then the software does nothing else ever. Uh, and it's configured it all of the image processing pipelines up and running. You know what I'm thinking about? Uh, sometimes I need to write some drivers or some uh, some software on very low level when, uh, mm -hmm. for example, we design 
uh, some of our boards and it's like sometimes super hard to make it work even if you have the hardware is working 100% mm -hmm. correctly and you cannot make it work in this software yeah. so how hard it is to actually make this work if you are not sure if even hardware is <laughs> working correctly so so generally it's actually it's not too bad um but you have to think about it a little bit you know i mean the first things to start thinking about you know is the fpga program does it have clocks you know is it in reset and and actually these things can be quite easily done but what's interesting is do you remember that ILA that I was talking to you about earlier on the the you know the integrated logic analyzer? Yeah. When you when it comes to doing debugging in this, I can set this system up such that when I hit a software breakpoint, my ILA will trigger. Or my or if my ILA triggers, I can set it to stop the software. Uh, so I can see the points. So I can do that cross triggering and cross debugging. So you can so actually see, see even more than you people can, who are just see the, writing drivers on standard processors yeah, so because they can, cannot see so you, inside of the processor so easily. No. So I, I can see I can see what's going off. If I if I'm if I'm stuck, I can sort of say, well, which way round is it? Is it the hardware that's at fault or the software that's at fault? And, and you can you can get you can do that they call it cross triggering you can do that cross triggering where you can where if you hit a breakpoint in the software it will trigger the ILA or if you set the ILA up it'll it'll trigger the uh, it'll trigger the breakpoint in your software and stop your software from running. Do you have so an example? Really... Oh, I'm sorry. Do you have an example how this uh, logic analyzer looks? The screen or or is it? I I, I don't know how to imagine this. Is it like screen of scope let's... or? <laughs> yeah, let's. Uh... Let's take a look. Let's take a look. So I have a, just bear with me one second while I find a USB cable. So we'll connect this little, uh, this little one to it. Hopefully when I picked it up, I didn't kill it. That's the board what you showed before with the camera. It is, and it's just got a USB cable okay, connected, no, it's, no. connected to it. So let's see if this wants to uh, actually play. So let's open the hardware design manager. Let's open the target and see if there's a target there. Well, that's good. It found the Digilent device, so that's a good start. And there you go. So that's what I was thinking about. <laughs> so it looks, it kind of looks like that. And we can do some interesting things. We can do some interesting things with it. You know, I don't know. I didn't mention it, but actually, they have this thing called the XADC on them as well. So it's a, it's a onboard ADC. Uh, and you can use it to measure external signals. Uh, in this case, I'm just, you can, but you can use it to measure temperatures and voltages, the uh, voltages. So, you know, it's... On the FPGA, um, you can measure... Uh, the, the FPGA. So at the moment, it's, it's, telling you it's, it's telling you it's temperature and it's telling you it's processor voltage um, there. So you can see it's jumping up a little bit between uh, 0 0.98 and, mm -hmm. and such like. So let's take a look at this ILA. Uh... This is so interesting. I have no idea actually. It will be so so good with the. I I really hope people will like it because this is completely new word for me. I I had no idea. It's now so uh, so really well implemented. It's really good. It is really, it is really good. Uh, what I need to find is, ah, here we go. So I'm just going to program this FPGA again. So this is um, this is what it looks like on the on the on the design. So you can see 
if I do an immediate trigger, uh, you can see there's not a lot of, you know, there's not a lot of, because we've not configured the camera, because I've just downloaded the software again, there's no software, uh, there's no software running on it at this point in time. Um, let's let's download the software. Okay. So it looks basically uh, like when you run simulations. Yeah, it looks, and that, I think that's that's on purpose, you know, to make it nice and to make it nice and simple and 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 show it. Uh, so here we go. So you should be able to run the software. And then should be able to go back here to the ILA and trigger the ILA. Maybe I have to refresh it. Refresh device. Oh, there yeah. Sam data. And now you can see, now you can see video coming, now you can see video coming down it. Um, so I'm not going to guarantee what video it is, but we can we can take well actually let's just tidy that up a bit because it's got so we can trigger on it if we want to you know so if I want to wait for the start of a new frame say I could pick on the T user here and I could say wait till the rising edge and then I could trigger on it and sort it out and you'll see you know the see the the, the start point there is uh, where the where the new frame begins. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see the you can see the valid date you can see the valid data you can see the ready you know the, the these two handshake signals if I wanted to check the end of line you know the end of line one uh, or the number of lines I could I, you know I could put this in I could ask it to give me a rising edge uh, and then trigger that as well so that'll trigger on the last pixel of the line essentially but you can do some quite interesting things with it so you could as opposed to having one big window. I could have 256. And if I trigger on that, you get lots of you get lots of smaller windows. So you can use that and you can put conditions just like you can on a logic analyzer. You can put conditions on here. So if I wanted to if I wanted to check the number of lines, for example, you know is what I expected to do. I could set some conditions up. So, you know, start of, wait till start of frame. After start of frame, start counting, you know, start Check counting the, the number of triggers you see example, on this one. Yeah. yeah, and then you can then you can, you can can have these trigger state machines that are quite compli complicated in there. Uh, so I use it quite often to just check that the video's coming out, you know, the video's coming out at the right, there's the right number of pixels on the line and there's the right number of stuff. And it, and it, saves, it saves quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of time. Obviously, in here, you know, in the software, uh, you can break point, you can single step, you know, I can pause it, you'll find it, it's running in this forever loop down the back. Uh, but I can take a look at the memory. So let's just remind myself where the memory is in here. So I'm just going to close this hardware view for a moment. And okay. Just open the block, open the block design again, because I can't remember what the address map on this one is. And if I go here, the DD. Ah, uh, is let's take a look. So the Vimo, the Vimo Zaic is at this address. Hopefully, I copied that. Uh, so we could go here. We can put this in here. So that's where your uh, camera. So this is data are starting. This is where the V. This is actually the V mosaic. So the V mosaic, like I said, the V mosaic's got control over this. Re it's controlled by a register from the software. So what you're seeing here now is all of the data, all of the configuration settings for the for the V mosaic. So that's a nice little example, really. I'll I'll go and plug this into the other side of the room, and then I'll sh I'll show you it uh, show you it working. I hope. So. I don't know how this is going to look, but let's take a look. But you can should be able to see yeah. over on my... If I flip this round, so I'll set this on here so as you can see the other part of my office. And then just to prove it works, I'll go and put my... Uh, nice. And in front of there and move it about.
So now, how it uh, started? Oh, so it, it the uploaded reason... the firmware from the Flash, or? Uh, but yeah, so it has it sits on a QSPI device, um, and it has a the Zinc has like this first stage bootloader program. So the processor system in the Zinc is the master. So the processor actually boots up, uh, and then it programs the FPGA, and then it starts running its application. And then it starts running its application. How do you enable uh, this bootloader? Is it inside of the block in the big diagram? Yeah, uh, no. So it's actually generated as part of this. So you can ah. see, you can see here it generates the the first stage bootloader. Uh, and if you want to, you can create a new application project. You don't, you know, you don't have to. Uh, but if I quickly go through here, uh, you'll see here it comes up with a first stage bootloader. Uh, so it will generate. So this will generate you the first stage bootloader that that starts the boot. And what this does is it transfers the it, well, it loads the FPJ image for you, and then it loads your application into DDR and starts running from DDR. Um, in a Linux, it's a little bit more complicated because it, 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 it has to load. Exactly, you, I wanted to, to ask. It has this. to load. And so with Linux. Um, it's a little bit more complicated because it has to load the first stage bootloader essentially runs for security reasons. Um, if I go back to this block diagram, okay, that's not connected anymore. Diagram, double click on here. So if we would like to run operating system. So, so on this block diagram here, you can see it says 256 kilobytes of SRAM here. So that's the on-chip memory. So the first stage bootloader has to fit within that on-chip memory. It doesn't run from DDR or anything. That's too small to, to run like a Linux boot bootloader. Uh, so yeah, in a Linux system, you have a first stage bootloader. The first stage bootloader loads actually loads U-boot into the into the DDR memory. See, so the, and then, and so then, the first and then stage you, bootloader configures the memories and then loads the yeah. U-boot from external uh, memory to the yes. DDR4 memories. Into the DDR into the DDR mm -hmm. and then it loads the loads the uh, loads the Linux image. So the first stage bootloader not only does it configure the memory but it configures the Zinc device as well, you know, the programming the, the registers and everything that are needed for its its deployment. If you want to see a Linux solution, so this little board, this is a custom board we did that we talked about it. It's got a slightly bigger brother on it than the than the Zinc chip over there. So this has got that's got a 7010 on it. This has got a 7020. So same processor but slightly more logic resources. Um, if I plug in its UART term, if if I plug in its UART here and we open it over the terminal. Um, new connection. I need to turn it on. Serial, you, you say serial, okay. So this is serial port. So I'm just going to hit reset. Up, yeah. yeah, I'm going to hit reset so as you can see it from mm -hmm. the beginning, though. Releasing reset. So you'll see it. It come. It, you'll see it comes up. You know, the first mm -hmm. day, the U boots running. Uh, actually, obviously, the first stage bootloader doesn't give any messages. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't give any messages out in this one, but you can see it's running U boot and then it's loading. So this is a this one's got a slightly different boot architecture to a lot of systems in that it's got a small it's got a QSPI device uh, where the first stage bootloaders first stage bootloader resides and where U boot resides. But the actual Linux operating system sat on an SD card, mm -hmm. uh, and the root file system sat on an SD yeah, card. Exactly. So it boots. Uh, that's what is very often done. I wanted to ask: so Xilinx provides also the uh, like documentation and way and source code uh, support for U-boot? Yes. Yeah. So U-boot so, so as part of this, so this is running what's called a pedal a pedal Linux. Peta Linux image of um, which is an embedded. It is, it's not a Linux distribution. It's a build. Peta Linux is a build tool. Uh, there is literally six commands 
uh, in Pedal Linux to build it. Uh, and you take that, when we did, the, if you remember back a few minutes ago, when we exported the hardware, the XSA, and we took that into Vitus, we can take that XSA as well, in a, and, it, and you have to be on a Linux development machine, you can't do it on a Windows machine, but we can take that XSA into a Linux into a Linux environment in, where the Peta Linux tools are installed, and we can create a Peta Linux project that configures to, the, to how that Xilinx shell archive is. So again, your embedded Linux solution reflects the hardware that you've just created uh, in, in Vivado. So it, okay. it, it pulls through all, it creates all of the device trees, it creates it, it creates all of the, everything necessary for, for Linux to, to boot. When you build that image, when you build that, it creates you the U-boot, it creates you the first stage bootloader, the U-boot, the image, oh. uh, and all the root, and all the root file, and all the root file systems. If you go to my website, there is uh, quite a bit about Linux, uh, Pedal Linux, and, and doing the Pedal Linux build, um, and how to configure it all. So there's a few. Uh, where's it gone? If I click on the census thing board here. So how new the kernel is, or, or how you can? It's on. It's on version. Five kernel five, I think, is the latest is the latest one. Uh, but essentially, I don't know if you can some, see my screen. But essentially, see. it's just an it's just a number of configuration menus like it, this, this where standard, you configure. Yeah, yeah. There's 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 three of them. One way you configure the um, one way you configure the overall project. One way you configure the kernel. One way you configure the root FS. One way you can configure U boot. But Really, it's just a wrapper around the Yocto flow. So it's just using Yocto underneath. Uh, and literally, it is just a case of create the project, create the project, point it to the XSA so that the XSA it can configure, and then click build, and it'll just build everything for you. What would you recommend if someone would like to now, you know, try what we were talking about? So I would, I, I, this question comes up on Reddit FPGA quite often. Uh, and I always kind of give the, I always kind of give a similar, a similar answer. Uh, and honestly, I am quite a big, you know, I am quite, I, I do use quite a, I, I do use quite a lot of Xilinx devices. So I do tend to, I do tend to prefer, to prefer them. My recommended one, if anybody's ever thinking about doing this, is to get one of these. So what Which is can you can you find it on the website? Yeah, I'll send you a link to it. But it's the it's a pink board. What's called pink. What makes it so interesting and why I say it's great is it's got the art, it's got the zinc processor on it, you know, the seventy twenty. So you can use it like exactly like we've done today to program to use Vivado to create things and, and such like. And you can create embedded Linux and such like if you want to it. But it's also got this thing called pink that runs on it uh, and pink is just it's just an ubuntu distribution really it, it's just a slightly different linux distribution but what really makes it really nice is there's a lot of ap there's a lot there's a lot lot more apis and, and drivers supplied for it than even with like the the vitus so you can really easily create your hardware design in vivado and then if you're still new to this you then still kind of think well i've got all this software to do and all this lot you know, if you're using Pink, you can actually come in there and you can write. It will automatically wrap around these IPs and pick up the right drivers. And then using Pink, you can actually write in just simple commands like grab me a frame of video, put me a frame of video output, and, and the Pink will and the Pink will do it. So I, and I, I, the reason I really recommend it is because they're part of the sort of, they come from the Xilinx University program, so the boards are quite cheap and there's a big ecosystem around it of people using them. Uh, and it's actually quite a lot, you know, so you get like on the, on the pink boards, you've got, it's got sort of HDMI in and HDMI out as well. And it's got sort of, uh, you know, the Arduino, Arduino shield and P mods and such like, so it's a really good development board on its own. Never mind. Um, you yeah, know, never mind about the pink stuff. They're about $150, something like that. 
probably slightly probably slightly less than that the will, big you, problem... will you need to pay for something else like i think the software is free or how it no goes. software everything's free all the software is free all the software is free uh so there's no license you don't even need to actually go and ask for a license actually you can just download it and start working with it uh so there's no there's no licensing so everything's free Uh, the great thing about the pink as well is all the pink sort of stuff's all open source, so you can go take a look at it, you can go experiment with it and, and play with it as well. Um, and I think it maps in nicely to where people are, that journey that I talked about, you know, where, where we're going up in levels of abstraction, I think this, I think these boards map it quite, you know, map it quite well uh, to, to do that. Uh, and I, I don't know, I have a real soft spot. If you look at my Hackster projects, you find i do so much in pink it's I mean, so much using pink it's untrue because it is just so so nice to use uh it makes it so nice and i have a lot of uh, a lot of industrial clients use it as well just because for like rapid prototyping because of that speed it gives you to just get up and running okay i have one more question probably the last one i think uh so let's go back to our original project PCI Express. Okay. And okay. Uh, basically, so once you configure this board, you put there all your software and everything, you need to plug in inside of your computer mm-hmm. and then you need to write drivers yep. for this operating system which you are running on computer or you can uh, use or Xilinx provide some drivers which you can use with the so that- board. So there are some drivers that you can there are some drivers that you can use to, to talk to it. Obviously it's a PCIe endpoint, so it fully you know it fully enumerates as a proper uh as a as a proper PCIe uh endpoint. Um and yeah, you can just start getting work, get get work if you've got Linux on there or something, you know, you can just start working with it and communicating with it and and, and talking to it from your host system uh to that to that endpoint. Uh, there's a whole host of questions where we could go here because there's the Alveo cards as well, which are PCIe based accelerators that sit in processors, uh, and that that's uh, probably a whole a whole different uh, different discussion. Yeah, I, uh, I just wanted to know because this was uh, one of the things what I know people would like to do. For example, they take uh, FPGA and they would like to use PCI Express to connect it to powerful processor and then do something and and I, I never had any idea how this is done and so I mean and... it's it's relatively it's relatively that straightforward you know because PCIe is a, a, a standard so that you know you can write you can write that you you write you have to write your application in software to sort of send the data across but it should be quite straightforward if you want to ex- If you want to just accelerate data, uh, Xilinx have a range of cards called the Albeo cards. Um, and they, they're literally designed just for that. So they just plug in over PCIe. So and, and as the engineer, then you wouldn't do any of you wouldn't do any of this design to create the PCIe infrastructure or anything. It already comes, it, it just has a very large FPGA. It's already got sort of the PCI endpoint, the PCI management all mapped through. And there's a suite of drivers and applications that you can use at the, in the software in the software side on the on the host application. And then what it does, it just does a thing called partial reconfiguration, where it reconfigures sort of 80% or 90% of the chip with your algorithm. Uh, and you can communicate with it over the over the mm-hmm. PCIe bus as well, like that. So they're quite they're quite exciting. I have one. Uh, the Linux machine I was yeah, showing well, you early on. I, I I have one. I have one in. I have one in there, uh, and it and it's it's phenomenal to sort of experiment and play and play with it and to just sort of you know write your application and you write it in um, write it in Vitus. You know you can um, you can if you've got the platform installed, it doesn't work out. It has to be on a Linux machine, not a Windows machine. But you know you write you write your application in Vitus, you compile it in Vitus, and then you can just run you can just run it. Um, actually, there is a couple of um, 
there is a couple of blogs on my website about how to get that. If anybody's interested about how to somewhere, there's some Alveo blogs about how to get Alveo up and running, which must be this this one here. So that's kind of the uh, perhaps part of the approach that you were talking about, where if you don't want to use a specific sort of off the shelf one, you can you can drop these accelerator cards. Okay, in. so and, when I'm talking to experts like you. How do you write driver on Linux? Driver get, for this PCI might... Express, I mean, like. Oh, so so for this card, it all it's all provided when you install it. It all Xilinx provide it all, uh, oh. and all and all the hooks and everything when you install. So this is here uh, on this here. You can see it's you know. So it will be something I, similar like before, like maybe this driver it, will load it. We'd load the data yeah, into it loads, memory. It loads the it, it loads the data, it pulls it all back, it does everything. All the oh. drivers for the Alve for the Alveo range, literally everything's there. All I have to do, all you have to do is write your application essentially. Which will access to specific in, memory space. Yeah. All you have to do is write your open your write your open CL application in Vitus and it just pushes pushes it across. Uh and then I don't know if I got an example but I don't know if I ran it. Yeah, so this is so you can see here. And sort of the first half of this blog is sort of how to install the card and make sure that the card's up and running, and then the second half is opening the Vitus application that we've that we've that we've been looking at. But this time it's on a Linux machine, uh, so it gets the acceleration flow enabled. So you can see we're selecting the the U50 card that's in there, uh, creating a simple sort of quantitative finance model that we want to accelerate. So, so this software will generate the application which will run on linux it will generate the application that will run on linux and it will generate the bit file that runs on the fpj as well and make sure the two work together it uses a uh, there's a framework called opencl uh that, that does that and opencl is designed to sort of have this heterogeneous computing system where you have a master where you have a host and multiple compute devices uh, and those compute devices could be anything, you know, they don't have to be an FPGA, it could be a DSP or a GPU or something it's not, like that. It's not used in but, graphic cards, for example? It's open, oh no, you're thinking of OpenGL, not ah, okay. OpenCL. <laughs> but, but you can use Open, yeah, but you can use OpenCL on graphics cards as well. So how it works is you have this like host computer, which is normally like an x86 or something. Then you have these acceleration nodes, which could be an FPGA or a GPU or a really high-end processor or something very specific. And they run what's called this OpenCL. You program those in what's called this OpenCL C language, which is C-like, but not quite C. Uh, and, it, and it allows you to be portable. So you can take that same application from one of these accelerators and move it from the FPGA to the GPU or the GPU to the FPGA. Uh, and it'll just compile and work. What won't move? What won't move is the performance, if you know what I mean. The performance depends upon what target you're using, uh, but the um, but the actual the, the actual code itself is portable, and that's how all these systems work. The you know that's how the uh, Alveo card works with the with the open within this OpenCL framework. And you still, but you still need like two applications: one which will run on the card, and one which runs on the uh, yeah. PC. Yes, but that's all created in that's all created I in Vitus. Wow. So when and I can't and because it's on my Linux machine, I, I no, it's okay. It's we, okay. I can send no, you some. Don't but, worry. but essentially, essentially, like this, like this picture here, you, you essentially have a bit that says host and accelerator, so you can write the host you write because you have two to, applications you, in you this write one two okay. and do the communication between the two with the OpenCL framework. Wow. Okay, it's, now I understand a lot. And that's really that's really where this journey's heading. You know, this this journey's heading to to write these open to to, to use OpenCL and and high level synthesis to you know to do a lot of the day to day programmable logic acceleration wherever wherever possible. And uh, that's everything for today's video. I would like to say. Thank you so much, Adam, because this was super interesting for me and I learned a lot. So thank you very much. 
If you would like to know more about Adam, uh, you can visit his website or you can have a look on his blog. He has like many articles, some of them we mentioned in uh, today's video. Uh, I would like to know what you think about this video. Did you find it useful? Did you learn something new? Did you know how all these complicated systems are implemented in, F in FPGA? I'll leave comments. If you like this video, don't forget to press like button. If you would like to see my future videos, don't forget you know exactly what to do. Don't forget to subscribe. My name is Robert Feranek. I would like to thank you very much for watching and see you next time. Bye.